everyone. Uh, welcome to the next episode of Tying with the Pros. Uh, we're here tonight with Derek Darst of St. Marie's Flies. Uh, Derek is one of the deer hair gurus uh, in the craft right now. He pumps out a ton of bugs, everything from divers to poppers, uh, a bunch of other creations as well. Uh, but today we're going to go through some basic techniques of deer hair work, uh, stacking and packing. Um, I don't know if he's going to do any spinning today. We'll see. We're going to go through a diver here together. And then he's got a, a, another fly already tied. The, the tying techniques are pretty similar uh, for the two patterns uh, between a diver and a popper, but how they're trimmed is different. So uh, anyone who has spent any time fishing for bass with a fly rod, uh, there's something special about these deer hair bugs. Uh, it's pretty impossible to recreate the action and sound uh, of a deer hair diver with anything foam or otherwise. So with that, uh, Derek, thank you for being here with us tonight. Thanks for having me. Okay, I'm ready to go here and I'll try and explain things the best I can as I go. I'm a, so I got a two aught Kona extra strong stinger hook here in the vise. And uh, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start out uh, tying in the tail and the weed guard. I'm gonna be using Danville 200, 210 for the, for the uh, tail and the weed guard. So um, I'll explain, we'll switch threads here when we get to the deer hair part. I'll explain that when we get there. So I'm gonna, Start my thread right at the hook bend and tie down the shank. Oh, I don't know, maybe a, or down the bend, excuse me, maybe a third of the way or so. Not too far. You don't need to go real far. You go too far, I think it kind of messes up your uh, hook sets a little bit. You seem to miss more fish. So, and I'm going to take a piece of this is just a, this is just regular old 30 pound mono, uh, nothing fancy. Um, I took a, you can see a pretty good sized piece here. And first thing I will do is double it over here. And one thing I always do is I'll mash the ends here with my pliers. And if somebody doesn't want to do a, a weed guard, this is an optional step, right? This is optional. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I tie it in all of mine just enough that I tell them they can clip them off if they don't want them there. But all mine, I do tie one in. So anyway, so I must mash the ends. That's just to, just to uh, give the thread a little something to grip here is all I do that for. So just to help them stay in the a little bit better. So I'm gonna tie those in, on, one on each side of the hook shank. Cover them up, make sure they're and good there we can put a little cement or uv resin or something over them thread wraps if you want to i don't know this is just a little loon soft head they usually stay in pretty well but if you're a pike or musky fishing it don't hurt to help to have a little extra on there because most of you guys probably know so okay we're gonna i got some neck hackles here picked out some kind of couple frog colors this is just a, all this this is just a hairline saltwater neck hackle I got a couple of Kelly green ones here and uh, and if somebody prefers, you know, somebody has like a rooster saddle or something like that. Uh, I mean, you can, yeah, use you can do, I, I do some with, yeah, I, I, you've done it with hand hack. You can do all kinds of different stuff with these. You don't, it don't matter too much. I like the, I like the kind of stiff neck hackle because it keeps them splayed like this. And then when you twitch them, it gives them that kind of frog kick to them. So, so I kind of go with you generally neck hackle on something like this. And how are you determining how long you want those say, legs? This is more of a person. I'd say I'm about a, oh, one and a half times the length of the hook. I would say I'm about, I usually just kind of, with these two odd hooks, I usually go back to where I'm just about touching the vise right here. I kind of got to, got to figure it out where I marked. So, and then uh, I don't know how long a bug that gives me, but I'd say it's about, about one at a time, one at a time, one and a half time. You can go a little longer, a little shorter if you want it. I don't think it's just more of a personal private the bass. I don't think it matters too much. You just kind of picture anyway, a, a frog profile and kind of right, legs right, up. yeah, pretty much, yeah. I'm, uh, yep. So I'm just going to tie them in on top of the hook shank here. So, I've got a set of pair of olive ones picked out here.
same thing. I'm just gonna, gonna tie these in on top of those about the same length. And is this a pretty common color combo for you? Yeah, I'd say the frog colors are probably some of the most popular, I would say. Um, I'll switch it up. I'll, sometimes I'll add, do yellow bellies, white bellies, uh, gray bellies. And just, just basically just tying those in right on top of the green ones. That, you can see that it'll give it that, give it a nice kick as you're stripping it in. And I'll snip those off. And we'll do a, a marabou collar here. I got a couple, I got a green one here and I will tie that one in on the bottom. Like that, about all oh, about half the length of the hackle feathers, I would say. Goes in, and I got another olive one. I will uh, just basically stacking one on top of the other, like that. Tie that into place. Would you say that marabou extends? It's hard to see just, but about halfway the length. Of the half. You can go a little longer, a little shorter. Like I said, I don't know. I'd say it's about half the length of the of the hackle feathers. Goes off. Add a little, add a little flash to it here. I just got some. This is the bullfrog green flash shabu. four or five strands or so. And I will slide that over my thread and double it over to help lock it in place. So you're not really worrying about splitting half of that on one side or the other, you're just putting it right over the top there. And I put it basically right over the top, yep. Yep, like that. And I, I always like to add a few strands of peacock curl, kind of, I don't know, like I said, I don't know much of a different mix, but it does look nice. So, yeah, about a little, long, little longer than the tail, I'd say I'm going with these, uh, the flash and the peacock curl. And uh, real quick before we get too far ahead, and I don't want to slow you down too much, but uh, you have a diver right there we could have a peek at just so folks oh, yep, can, yep. you know, see yep, what we're, we're like doing. This. Can't quite see that. There we go. Yep, you bet. Okay. And so we got, that's, that's our tail. So we will tie off the thread here. And we're gonna switch over to the, to the gel spun thread for the deer hair. And you're and using that 200 GSP there probably? It was 200 denier, yep. It's super strong. And even the, even the hundred, as you know, it's, pretty well strong enough but one thing I find with the 100 is I have a tendency a lot more to cut through the deer hair with the 100 than you know every once in a while you'll pull tight it'll just because it's thinner it'll slice through it so anyway but uh what reason reason I stick with the Danville for the tail and the weed guard is it, it grips better it's not as strong but it grips better it'll grip the weed guard better and all that so that yeah that GSP uh, slides and then that's part of this yeah and that's as folks will see. That's part of why you you're going to be using it is for that right. to slide right. as you start stacking here. Yeah. So. Okay. So we'll do. I got some white picked out. So we'll do. This is just deer belly hair. Nice long, select deer belly hair. And we'll cut off a pretty. You're going to cut off a pretty good sized chunk. You can see I. You can see I got a good sized clump there. This is gonna be the form of the belly of our fly. I'll cl comb out some under fur here. What would you say that's a, probably a couple pencils or so? Oh, that's like a couple Sharpies probably, I would say. So you're, you're not, you're not afraid here. Yeah, there's a, next to a Sharpie, there's a lot of hair there. It's a Sharpie, so, so people different. talk about, that's, that's about a half a dozen pencil thicknesses, I think there, or four or five anyway, probably. So, and when you so and, and that's for the belly. So when you're doing the top, are you doing just about the same or how are you 
Yeah, I would say a little more on the top maybe, but uh, if you're not, if you don't want to use that big of clumps, you could do two clumps of white for the belly too, and just, you know, do a smaller clump. If it's a little easier for you guys to handle it, a little more easier for you to control, you can just do, do your first two clumps for white. So just spin one or I'll explain it to you here as I go. Awesome. Uh, this is the, uh, it takes some, this is liquid fusion here. I'm going to add a little of that here where I tied off my thread and started my GSP. And so this is the front of the belly you're flying. I'm just going to lay this right on top and it's going to go, oh, still have a little of that marabou showing. I'd say I'm just into the deer hairs just past the bend of the hook. And I'm going to keep that on top. Take it in my left hand. I'm gonna do a couple of loose wraps, tighten it just a little bit. On the third one, I'm gonna let it roll around to the bottom of the hook. See there? And then I'll press down with my thumb here. You can see I kind of grip the hook, hook eye with my index finger and then I pull down. And like I said, if you want, you know, weren't comfortable sometimes using those big, big clumps, it's a little harder to control especially if you don't have a lot of practice and you might, you know, lose some, but you could do one small clump of white and then you could stack another clump of white on top of it and push down. But I use a bigger clump just to save a step, but uh, nice. it might make, it easy, might make it easier for someone who's just beginning, I'm, I think, to, you know. Yeah, I'll add that smaller. too. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was what what was that? No, go ahead. What were you saying? I'm sorry, I had a little bit of uh, internet lag there for a sec. Oh, um, oh, okay. I, I okay. was just going to say though, uh, you know, if somebody... How dense we tie these is at some level personal preference. Um, like when I when I do some deer hair work and, and I'm not nearly as fast uh, with deer hair as Derek is, um, mm -hmm. I'll use a couple pencils, um, but it does. Right. It takes more clumps. And right. you know, when you stack it, it's going to be harder to get my deer hair bugs as dense as Derek is able to just given the amount of material. Right. And and that's where you get, you know, your density is from a lot of, you know, people talk about packing, but a lot of the uh, the amount of deer hair is just probably actually more important than the packing as far as getting density. If you ain't got a lot of hair on there, it don't matter how much packing you do, it's not going to be dense if you ain't got a lot of hair on there. So anyway, so uh, yeah, lots of hair. If you have to use more more clumps, that's fine. But the more hair you got in there, the more dense it's going to be, and then it's going to make your flies float longer. They're going to it's going to make them more durable and all that. So that's why you want that's what that's why you want that density to them. So okay. So next I'm going to go with, I got some Kelly green here. Yes, Kelly green belly hair. And I'm not going to take quite as big a clump as I did for the belly, but I'd say about, oh, I'd say about half of what I had. You can see there about half of what I had with the white. And I'll comb out that under fur. And drop it in the stacker there. And, and while he's stacking that, if anybody noticed, uh, he put more glue again before this top tie. -in. Oh yes, I forgot. Uh, to, sorry, I get to talk and I forgot. No, I no, a little, the, little glue on. Glad you're glad you're paying attention. Yeah, <laughs> you're fine. I was going to explain just a little bit of why I've got some liquid fusion right here too. It's a great mm -hmm. glue. Um, but you know, I also use a lot of uh, water-based uh, loon head cement. Is a good yeah, one. Loon, so loon um, soft head. You could use that for that too. That works pretty well. I kind of like the convenience of liquid fusion just to squeeze bottle and squeeze a little bit. Oh yeah. So, well, and, and the biggest reason, that you, and please correct me if you did, if this isn't why you're doing it, but the reason I use the slower setting uh, right. cement and options is because when you tie that in there, you're still going to be working with it for a sec. But when you really right. pack that hair back, um, you're going to want it to set and not slide on top of that GSP base. And if you, yeah, don't use glue. You're definitely you're going to have clumps that want to turn and other pieces. Right. Yeah, people, and I see people use super glue too. And the thing with something like super glue that dries real fast is that you know if something's off or something's turned a little bit, you can still move it because it hasn't dried yet with the with like the liquid fusion or something like that. Where if you got super glue, you're pretty much stuck there, you know. Yeah. And then when you go back to pack, it's not going to slide back either. It's going to be glued right where it is. So. Yeah. So yeah, I see people using. Super glue, and I tried that a little bit when I was first starting out, and I didn't, I didn't like, I didn't like the <laughs> super glue. So anyway, so it's all part of the so learning process, that, right? Well, that's right. We'll put that Kelly green right on top of that white, and like he said, I put a little liquid fusion on there on top of that white, and that just kind of holds everything into holds everything together there. And same thing, I'll do a couple loose wraps. 
and this is where it gets to stacking rather than spinning. The white was the, is the only is the only clump that'll be spinning as I spun it around to the bottom of the hook shank. This will stay right in place on top of the white. So, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put my thumb right in the middle, grab the eye of the hook with my index finger, and push down and pull. You can't want to give it a slow, steady pull. You got to pull hard. But if you pull too hard, really all at once, sometimes it will it'll slice through that hair, that GSP, because it's so strong. So, and, and while so you're doing up with that. Stuff, Go ahead. I was going to say, and while you're doing that, uh, and this is going to happen to you if, you, if, if you've never tied with deer hair before, but you'll catch the tip of your hook every once in a while and it'll break. Uh, yeah, it'll, yeah. Usually I try to start, I should have said that earlier too. I usually try to start my body right about even with the th thread, even with the point of the hook, as you can see there. For that reason? Yeah, that's usually about where I stop my tail and start right about even with the hook point. So nice. That first stack, you sometimes got to be a little careful not to clip that hook point. So I figure while you're saying all the correct ways to do it, I'll go ahead and input the where I've messed up and learned the hard way stuff, and it will be a good. Right, yeah, good. Yeah, and it's stuff. Sometimes I forget little stuff like that to mention too. So I'm glad you're bringing it up. That's probably, probably been happening. a while some since you. Stuff, some of this stuff's <laughs> such a habit that I forget to even say. You know. Sure. So, so anyway, what would you say you tie? You probably tie thousands of these a year, right? Probably, yeah, I'm sure, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Now I got I got a clump of all of a little, about like the, about the size of the green. I Maybe a little smaller. And I will put that in my stacker. How do you like that loon stacker? Good, real good, yeah. Yeah, a nice, nice, big, large one's nice for deer, good deer hair stacker, so. Good for this kind of stuff, so. Good knowledge, thank you. Yeah, I have had the, the pin, the little pin here started coming out on me, and I just put a little little UV resin in there. It seems to have stayed into place since then. So I have dropped it a few times though. Here I've got a concrete floor in here, so maybe a, something broke. But yeah, it seems to be doing fine now. So nice. anyway, okay. So I when I push down like here with my thumb, it kind of left a little a little hole right there, a little crater in the top there. So what I'll do is I will put my olive right on top of there right where that little spot is that I pushed in with my thumb. And the same thing, two loose wraps. And I'll push down, just like before, push down with my thumb. And you're trying to keep each of those thread wraps through the same yep, groove yep. in there each another, time, right? Another good thing to mention. Yep, I try to keep my thread in the same place with each wrap. So that way you're not trapping hair fibers and folding them over and stuff like that. And that'll leave a little, if you do though, if you get, don't, before you get too far, you can, you know, if you see some, it don't hurt to watch and you can kind of pick them out with your bodkin or something. So, okay. But now, I'm ready for our next color. So I took another oh, pretty good size clump of black here. And you can do, sometimes I'll do five, six colors. I'm just going to do four on this one just because, uh, a little easier for you guys, for you guys who are just starting out. If you do too many colors, it's more colors you got, the more things are the lesser chance of things lining up just right. You know what I mean? So yeah. And, so and, gonna... and one thing I, I just want to point out is is Derek's had enough of these that he has a really good sense for how much hair uh, each clump right. is going to go. Where by the time he gets all his stacks in, you know he knows there's a little bit more than is on the bottom, so the fly rides right side up. Right. Um, right. For anyone who's new into deer hair work, uh, you can actually pre-cut out your your clumps so that you can visually look at them on right. the desk That's, and timetable yep. in yep. front of you so Absolutely, that you know, yeah. okay, I've got that little bit more hair on the top versus the bottom um, until you at least get a feel for it. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna, I just put that black right in the same spot on top of that olive, just like I did with the, just like I did with the last couple of clumps. And I'm just gonna try to keep my thread in the same spot. Two loose wraps. And you can see there are two. One thing I did is you can use the rotary kind of function kind of once you get that first wrap on there to make sure you're keeping your thread in the same spot and to make sure none of them hair fibers are folding over on you. So anyway, I guess I got three wraps there now, but that's okay. So this last clump, the black, I'm going to kind of pinch the sides to keep it on top and then I'm gonna pull down. And that keeps that thing right in the center up there on top. So, so that'll be my first, that's my first stack as we would call it. 
And how many stacks yeah. will you will you use on this fly? I'll get I'll get three on this one, and I part part of a, the fourth, like the last one. You know, I might not have much room, so you can see like on this, the last stack. I just did a couple of colors. I got yellow and green here, right at the, right at the very end. Nice. So uh, basically, it was kind of like three and a half stacks in a way. Next thing I'm gonna do, so I'm through that, I kind of weaved through the through the hair there to the front of that stack. Next thing I do, I got a little square of plastic here. You can see I cut a slot in it. And I'm gonna use that kind of as a guide to keep my, some guys don't do this until they get out of the end. I do it with each clump. It just makes, keeps everything out of the way. And then I'll, walk, I'll wrap some thread in front here. I just that plastic just kind of keeps things back and out of the way for my next stack. So are you using a, are you using a fugly packer to to compress everything? Uh, yep, yeah, I got a yep, yeah, I got a fugly packer here. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Awesome. So I'll add a little more of that liquid fusion here to these thread wraps. I'm gonna take a, a real big clump here. And I'll comb out that under fur. And this is the same technique if you've been watching the rest of our series that you'll see us do with bucktail. And anytime you have those random fuzzies and random length shorter fibers right. that are in the under hair, uh, they really impact how uh, how well they cinch to the shank. Same thing as the first. We're just basically repeating what we did last time. We're and here I'm. You don't need the tips because they're. The first row, that first stack, the tips will be part of your collar. This you don't need the tips, so I just trimmed them off. And I like the same thing as before, two loose wraps. The third one, I'm spinning it around, pressing down, grabbing the eye of the hook with my index finger and pulling down. And oh, that kind of fell out, but it's okay. We got once you got that first plump in there, it kind of holds the pair back anyway. So, so now I'm ready for this. Got a spot ready for my lump of green hair and what's so cool about this technique while he's cutting that is that it's not just frogs and divers and poppers um, there's any number of different deer hair pattern shapes that you can sculpt these into with the razor when you're done so these foundational deer hair uh we'll call them fundamentals are, are something that'll serve you well for any type of deer hair work you want to do yep yep exactly and i'll add a little liquid fusion on top of this white like before and basically that just gives a gives you something to keep the to uh help secure all the deer air to your hook shank. And a couple of loose wraps. Push down with my thumb and pull. And there he is. And I got a spot all ready for the olive to go. Hey Derek, my calendar reminder says we have a video that we're recording. Should we do that? I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> Must be 5:30, huh? <laughs> 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 there's my olive right on top of the green keeping my thread in the same spot and two loose wraps and some of that's wanting to slide out on me a little bit there and pull down are you spinning your gsp kind of intermittently to keep it strong oh uh, yeah once in a while you can if you uh if you want you can Spin your bob a little bit to keep it from getting getting all wound up. Um, some people do that. I don't worry about it too much usually. I don't really think about it really, but some people are pretty 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 careful about you know worrying about their thread getting twisted and all that. But well, and I'm sure that your thread can your tension control is such that you're very rarely pulling so hard that you break your thread. And it yeah, I hardly ever have this break. And like I said, it's so strong anyway that I don't really think that it, with the GSP, you have to worry about it too much. But I'd always forget when I downsized from, you know, bigger bass bugs uh, and went to like, you know, size fours and down, I would, I'd like to use, you know, the 100 GSP in that spot. Right. Yeah. And it's hard to turn off horsing it after you've been doing that for any sort of time. Right. Yeah, I got my black here, ready to go, right on top of the olive. And I 
Okay, I can see here. I got a. You see a little, a little green kind of. If you can see it on there, a little green kind of ran down to the belly there, and you can kind of pick that out and move it back to where it goes with your bodkin if that happens. And I'll just kind of work it back up there into the. I don't know how well you guys can see that on there, but. Every once in a while, you're pulling this way. Some of it kind of wants to work its way that way, but for whatever reason. But and you have, you have enough hair in there too that if your preference was to maybe grab tweezers and pull that out before trimming, you could, yeah, time too, right. right, yeah, you could, yeah. Usually just just a needle or a bodkin, and you can kind of you can kind of work it back to where it should be. So anyway, okay. So I'm gonna just gonna pull down. Black is in place, and now we're. the thread up to the front of that and give that a little push with the packer there you can see you can see how much hook shank i have there and you can see after i pack it here how much more it gives me you can see that on there and then i will wrap a little thread base here let me grab my uh piece of plastic here first actually and and this is personal preference for anyone who doesn't want to put their plastic up in between each step. Yeah, some uh, people don't until they get out of the end. I, like I say, I always do, but. I'm sure it makes life easier. It does, yeah, it only, it only takes a second. So I'm just gonna push that back, push the train, push them thread wraps back. And you see how much more hook shank that give me. Mm -hmm. Now I'm ready for my third stack here. We're back to the white hair. And Derek, what weight rod do you usually fish these on? Uh, generally an eight. Most an eight weight? Eight. Yeah, yeah. And does that be, I mean, could you cast on a lighter rod if you wanted? Is that because they get heavy um, with water, wind? What's, what's your rationale? You could. I, you could. Uh, they, they get a little heavy. And, and the wind, there's a lot of wind resistance with these, you know, quite a bit. So I, I think the heavier rods, some of ties twos and fours, though. I think a, a, a six weight would probably be no problem. You know, one of these bigger two odd bugs, I would think, I think the eight would be the way to go. So. Running out of, running out of liquid fusion there. Okay. So same thing as before. So just a re repeat of the first few, first two stacks, a couple of loose wraps. Spin it around, push down. And for anyone who's starting with deer hair, when you first start doing the step that Derek's doing there, when you do those first two loose wraps and you start to tighten it down, a lot of you may want to try before you even start to spin it with your thread, actually taking your thumb and doing it at the same time. You switch your you switch the bobbin into your left hand and you have your hair in the right and you just kind of pull it and you can actually do it mm -hmm. manually. And also if if you know you're not if that's a little tough for you at first, you can always just turn your vise over and, and tie it in on the bottom of the hook like this and cinch it down and just and just and then you would just pinch it to keep it up, you know, mm -hmm. keep it there from rolling over. That's and a great point. Go back and that's another trick you can do if you're, you know, if you're not comfortable spinning it around the hook like that. If you want to just, you know, just tie it in place on top like that, well, it would be on bottom, but oh, that's a, that's a great point. It. And then, you know, you can just, yeah, turn it over and then start back on your green again. So uh because i'm sure we have some yeah, tires that's an option too yeah because i'm sure we have some tires that are you know right your yeah. hair oh, curious yeah. oh, for sure yeah it's not it's not gonna be easy for them at first for sure yeah yeah you're when you start your hands will definitely be sore when you get through the first few because you're doing things with your fingers holding these clumps of hair that you know these are not the same muscles that you're doing with uh, right. a lot yep. of bucktail yep, work exactly yeah, just another repeat of Stacks one and two. Two loose wraps, push down. With that, ready for my olive. And when you fish these, uh, if you were describing to folks, you know, okay, you, you put that cast out, your line lays out, and a big old bucket mouth or, or smally blast it on the surface. Do you just turbo strip set or, or what do you do? Small mouth and the large mouth, it's kind of they're, they're kind of two different 
two, two different the way they hit it is totally different it seems like the small mouth kind of fly out of the water and the bat the large mouth kind of just gulp it you know i don't know i guess it's kind of instinct thing i just i never really think about it, <laughs> the way i set the hook but uh it was a bit of a leading question um and you alluded to it talking about the difference in the in the strike because I, i've definitely seen that like i've had smallies come three four feet out of the water oh yeah they fly the fly in their mouth and largemouth, though, you know, especially if you're in like water with pike and they're hitting your, your divers and poppers too, um, our reflex sometimes is a little bit uh, hyper fast when it comes to these fish hitting. I mean, you want to be on, but there really is, you have a second for the fish to eat it, to turn, and then right, just Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, I give it, you kind of want to almost delay it just a little bit because it's, it's easy to be too quick and, and pull it out of their mouths, I think. Okay, so I got my clump of black here. Last yeah, I, for this stack. I love fishing uh, deer hair stuff. I, when I first started fly fishing, I mean, I, I really I spent seven years doing nothing but topwater smally work. Oh, and, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, to this day, um, we, we got a pond out back here that um, I don't think there is a single pattern that works as effectively for these fish that are used to hitting shallow, clear water with a ton of food than a frog diver. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so I got my third third stack all done there. I'm going to give that a little, a little push with my packer here. And I still got it. You can see I still got a little bit of hook shank showing. Oh, let me throw it up. I'll put my plastic on here again. This is where the plastic really comes in handy is when you get out here to the end like this. You can see I got And if you want, uh, some folks like to do a, a half hitch here or a couple half hitches. Yeah, in between they don't hurt to do it. You can do a couple of half hitches. Yeah, especially that you know if you if you're trimming it and you cut your thread there right at the beginning or something, you only gotta only gotta redo that last stack. So yeah, that doesn't hurt at all. Do a couple right there. That was nice of you to humor me. You didn't have to do that. Oh, yeah, that's. <laughs> So I won't do as much hair here because we're clear out on the end and it's there's not a lot of room left. I'll add some more. A little dab of liquid fusion there. And the same thing, I will two loose wraps. Spin it around to the bottom. By this point in the fly, you, you have a pretty good sense of how much shank each clump is going to take. So, yeah, it's generally this size. Like, like I said, I, I almost could have got four on here if I did some real small clumps. I think what I'll do with this last clump here is I'll probably do like a blend of maybe green and olive. Cool. And, and so I'll just take a, I'll show you here. I'll take a little, a little clump, a little clump of green. And I'll take a little clump of olive. I got them here together. I'll just kind of blend them together in my hand here. Take more than you need because you always lose some. When you're blending. When you're blending, yeah, you usually yeah. always lose some. It's a little messy, but it does look cool. And you can see I got them all blended. They're a little, little uneven here, so I'm just going to stick them in the stacker butt first. I got a I got a couple of colors, all a couple of colors blended together now, olive and olive and green. So, and I'll just uh, and you're done stacking at this point. You're just filling the end of the shank, right? The, yeah, this will be the last. Yep, yeah. I'm just going to stack this right on top of the white, and that'll be the last of it. So, so I will lay that right on there. And the same thing, two loose wraps, and I'll just kind of pinch this, keep it in place, and keep it right on top of that white. You can see I, you can see the hook, the hook eye is just about completely buried there. So, and it often is at this point in the fly, right? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes you can't hardly see it at all. It was a little bit showing, but that's where your packer really comes in. Yeah, but not to fear, you'll get it back here. 
Yep. And that's they say, you know, you start out tying and they say they say don't crowd the eye of the hook, but this, these are the exceptions. So I you can't crowd the eye of the hook. So <laughs> yeah, you can throw a few half hitches in there just to make Adam happy here. Especially <laughs> on the end, I always start throwing some half hitches. So okay. So we are we are done with that part. Now we got a big ball of fuzz here. You can see there. And that's where we find our double edged razor blade here. Grab a fresh one. And so I just got a, this is just a double edged razor blade. And I always, I always trim in the bottom first. So I'm gonna turn the fly upside down here. And you can you can trim in the vise. Some people trim in the vise. I always hold in my hand. But uh, anyway, I'm gonna start out with the belly, and I'm just basically just laying it flat over the hook eye, and just kind of take off a little bit of a time at a time. You don't want to do too much. And I just kind of keep working my way down towards the hook shank. And this step's this the same for a diver or a popper, correct? Yep, yep. I always do the belly first, frogs, mice, anything. Really are all basically tied the same or just really trimmed different mostly. So you can see I've you see I've trimmed the belly, it's right down close to the hook shank there. I might you know, take just a hair more off, but you don't so you tie your there. So you you tear your weed guards in, then uh, at the end you finish all your trimming, and then you put it back on, and and yep, then the weed guard will go. Yep, awesome. Yep, so so yep. so the belly is all trim. You want to open up that hook gap as much as you can. So okay, so now we'll start. Now I'll work on the face, and how I do that is I will lay my razor blade against the hook eye here, and I will just kind of push up at a little bit of an angle. We're at so far. I haven't done the sides yet, but I'm going back. I'm going back. Oh, kind of about oh, just probably two thirds of the way through that second stack. You know, I'm going to do the sides. You get to the point it's almost more like sanding than trimming because you're taking so little off. You're just kind of smoothing it out almost. And for anyone who's starting with deer hair, maybe you've only had a couple uh, stacked bugs or, or maybe you've you know, been looking to get consistency in your shaping. Uh, we have another segment that we've done here where we talk about trimming in basic shapes. So if you notice that Derek did that flat belly first, then he did the flat top, and then he's starting to round from there. Um, right. It's a lot easier to think about it in, in terms of where do I start, you know, with these flat shapes and then round than to try to get there all at once because very rarely will right. it work out yep. the way you want yep. if you do. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you don't want to overdo it. It's I have a lot of people that tell me like, oh God, I, you know, I started trimming it. And next thing I know, I didn't have anything left. I hear that. That's something I hear a lot from people. You know, I get to trim it and the next thing I know, there was hardly anything left. So you gotta, you gotta kind of tell yourself when to stop. But like I said, it gets almost to the point you're just almost like sanded and I'm taking so little, you can see it's just, it's just a little dust coming off here. So 
but I think you could, I could actually kind of do this for days and still find little spots. Oh, I should have got a little more there, a little more there. But like I say, you got to kind of tell yourself, okay, time to move on. So, okay, so I've got the face pretty well all formed. So the next thing I will do is take my, I've got a pair of curved scissors here and I will, I will form my collar here. And it's a little tricky to yeah. see what you're doing. So, yeah. Yeah, you can see I kind of formed the outline of the collar there. And I'll go back to my razor blade and I will just kind of go around following that same line I made with my scissors. And I kind of give it a little taper. And while Derek's trimming that or, or sculpting that or whatever you choose to call it with your, your blade work. Uh -huh. um, uh, I, there's one thing I do want to point out is that if you make your collar too tall, um, you're going to end up with issues with your fly flipping upside down in the water because once it yeah. saturates with water, it's going yeah. to outweigh your hook shank and go underwater. Right. It's going to want to want to spin around. It'll spin on you. And so, yeah, you don't want to leave a super long collar. I've seen some guys that leave a big hole in it. I don't know. I just, I've never had luck with that. I know of a couple tires that leave a pretty high collar successfully. Ryan Gold's one. Uh, uh -huh. He ties some good stuff and it, it does have a pretty tall collar, but the way he trims the rest of the bug, there's not a whole lot of material to saturate and flip. So, uh -huh. um, yeah. you know, he, he knows exactly what he's doing, but you know, I've definitely seen some that are really tall with a lot of material and it's going to be hard right. to have those swim right through a day efficient. Right. There's a, that's beautiful. Got my collar pretty well. Trim this a couple spots. It's a little uneven, but I don't think the fish are going to care. But but us meticulous types will have nightmares if we leave it like that. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, basically. When you dropped your stacker earlier, I was going to ask you, have you ever dropped your scissors on your bare feet? I don't know. I haven't, but I got concrete floors in here and I've, <laughs> I usually pair of scissors about a, last me about a month and I just drop them on the <laughs> tips, I swear. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's sad. Yeah. No problem. My foot, my feet at least cushion the fall. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like I'm going to get a picture at some point from Derek just at like yeah, 11, yeah, 11 o'clock at night where he catches his scissors with his toes <laughs> if I do that, like next week I'm gonna know you jinxed me so <laughs> I yeah. hope not yeah <laughs> I blame you so okay next thing I'm gonna take another piece of that plastic like I had earlier and I'm gonna poke a little hole in it here and I'm gonna stick that hook eye through that little hole right there you know I will just, just kind of pushes my hair back and I will restart my I'm gonna go back to the Danville here I had that I used that I tied my weed in, weed garden tail in with earlier I'll start my thread right there put that tag in and I'll take this cut this loop out of the weed guard and I will Take the first side, I'm gonna put it right up here, right on this side of the shank, right behind the hook eye, and a couple of wraps. Kind of hold that in. Now I'll grab the other side, go to the opposite side. And a couple of wraps. Are you focused on getting those even right away or do you have uh, not yet? No, they're and I'll show you a little trick here because that's really hard to keep them things perfectly cinched down tight. So now I'm gonna I'm just gonna cinch them down real good here. Show you a little trick I got for 
we go. And now you can see they're, they're in pretty tight. They'll move, but they are in pretty tight. So now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take that plastic out of there. I'm gonna pull them. I'm gonna pull them right so they're right up even against the hook point here. You can see that the, they're right about even with the hook point here. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take them and I'm gonna clip them off all a little long here, about like that. You can see there. I don't know if you can see how see real good on there how much they're sticking out, but yeah, we gotta tie this off real quick. Let me uh, throw some half hitches in here. And if you know if you're someone who wants to whip finish there, you're welcome to do that the same. Whip finish, fine too. Yep. Yeah. Uh, anyway, okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is lighter. There's my lighter. Okay. So I'm going to take one side of that and I'm going to just kind of hold it out away from the deer hair here with my bodkin, and I'm going to give that a little, add a little flame to that and melt it back just a little, just so it sticks out. I melt it back to just a little bit past the hook eye. And you see that makes a little ball on the end there. And then I'm going to pull that down into my thread. And if that thing's still hot, you can kind of push it in. It'll kind of almost melt right into your thread wraps there. But anyway, it gives that little ball on the end. That'll help that keep from slipping through that slipping through them thread wraps. And it makes it long enough since you started nice and even. Right. With the hook. Yeah, you started like even with the hook shank. And now by pulling it back, pulling it down. And I'm going to do the same thing with this side. Sometimes it gets gets melting fast on you. You got to kind of tap it with your finger there, but you know, I'll do the same thing. There we go. And now you can see it's. You don't want to. You don't want to leave too much, too much mono out. You know, about a sixteenth of an inch or so is all you need. Eighth of an inch, maybe not much. You see some. Of, I see some guys with their weed guards way out here, but you don't want it that. That's gonna. That'll uh, definitely. Uh, affect your hookup rate. So anyway, so their weed guards all tied in there. And now we're ready for some eyes. Which I didn't have eyes laid out, but here we got some. These are eight mil actually they're 8.5 mil. These are just fish skull living eye or uh dragon eyes I guess. And I grabbed a couple kind of chartreuse frog colored ones. And I'm gonna, this is a Loctite gel control super glue, which I left the lid off of apparently. And hold on one second here. Yeah, this little, little gel control super glue. Do that into place right behind, right in front of the uh, collar there. And do the same thing on the other side. Do you ever cauterize uh, sockets for your eyes? I have, I've done that, I do that. So actually my cautery tool, I, I broke the tip on it and I've ordered new ones, but they've been out of stock for like, for like two months, I'll bet at least. I have some 3D eyes that these ones, it's not too, doesn't really matter too much, but I have some that are like, like thicker and I like to like to, you know, cauterize a little hole for them. But with the like ones like this, it don't matter too much. I like to leave them exposed a little bit. Cause you know, a lot of times a fish is looking up at it. If you got them completely buried in the hair, they're not even gonna know they're and it there. it sees anyway, that so. frog eye profile. Yeah, so I like sure. to give a little bit of an eye profile. You know what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, those are all glued on. And the last step is I'll add some rubber legs. Okay. So now I just got a couple of, I got a, like an olive and a Kelly green, uh, just medium round rubber legs. And I will got two of each. And then this is just a, they got leg pullers and stuff. This is just a big sewing needle is all this is. And they work just fine too. Except, nice. for a leg pull, except for a leg puller is easier to find because it has a handle if you set it down. <laughs> yes, since I just spent five minutes looking for this, but yeah, but that's anyway. much more cost effective. Yeah. So anyway, we're just gonna pull them through, and then I'm gonna go in right behind the, right in between the first and second stack stacks, just behind the collar, and I'm just gonna push that through there, keeping it as close to the hook shank as I can. There you go. 
And you can't, act, the silicone legs will actually last better with the sun and all that, but I have more of a tendency to break and pulling them through. So I usually use rubber. Like I said, the silicone holds up to, you can see I pulled them through here, you can even them out. You can see, you can add a little glue to the bases of them, but you can see they're in there tight. They barely move. Do you usually glue them or kind of depends? I usually add just a little liquid fusion to the base, yes, but I, I don't think it's really necessary. You know, I do it anyway when, I, when I'm coating the eyes and everything and coating the collar, so. That's what you brought up a good point. So you're using liquid fusion to do all the other stuff too when you're yep, coating. Um, it. That's what that'll be coming up next. Yep. Liquid oh. fusion for the eyes and all that. And all I'm happy that you it. brought that up because if, if somebody tries to use, and I, I use the ultra control gel version of the Loctite stuff for a lot of things uh, uh -huh. as Derek does, but it does not work well in the capacity of anchoring your rubber and your silicone. Yeah, and, it, and it leaves like a big white looking gunky looking spot too. And I don't like that on my, you know what I mean? And it makes them fragile material. too. What's that? And it makes them fragile too. Yeah, if you try does, to yeah. use this, yeah, you'll actually break them pretty easy. Ugly spot. Yeah, I don't like yeah. that. So anyway, yeah, so I'll use the liquid fusion and I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll add a little, add a little drop at the base of these legs. Like I said, I don't really think it matters. I do it anyway. And then I'll coat the collar here. And you want to give that a pretty good coating to help push some water and give you that nice bubble trail. I'm about out of this stuff. And I can attest, your flies yeah. fish very nicely. Oh, you've been fishing them? Yeah. Oh, I've, good. I've fished yeah, a few of your flies. Yeah. So I give the eyes a good coating of this stuff to help help uh, just help seal them to the fly and help the, I like to cover all those edges and make sure that edges, now there's no edge for a tooth or something to catch a hold of. And mm -hmm. I'll do a little around the, around the weed guard here. And then uh, last place, the belly. And I try to give a pretty good generous layer on the belly. And re one of the reasons for that is it helps the fly keel over to it, add a little weight to the bottom. So it'll help your fly layer right in the water. So nice. Plus just, just for the added durability as well. And if you don't do this, if you're someone who, you know, wants to tie it and then go fish it. I mean, I've, I've got a, a diver that before I hooked it on a log and couldn't get it back and it, it rotted out easily had 15 or 20 fish on it. They're pretty durable. Yeah. And these will last for even longer than that. So, so there's a completed coated and your hair diver. That is a beautiful diver. No, Thank you for you. showing us how to do dry, Just has to dry and it's ready to fish. And how long do you let those dry when you coat them with that liquid? Uh, like a day or so overnight, at least I would say. So I don't know exactly how long it, it'll be. It's pretty, it's pretty well. They're pretty dry in a couple of hours, actually, but I like to yeah, give them a little longer probably before I'd fish them. But I mean, I can, well, I'll show you on these. I'll show you how, I'll show you how I do the uh, faces of these poppers. And you know, they're usually, the faces usually are fairly dry to where I can work with them after a, after a couple of hours. So anyway, I'm going to show you how I get the flat faces on these poppers. And basically everything's tied the same. Everything's tied the same, but it's just trimmed different. And then I'll show you how we, how I make the faces. So here's one that's all tied, ready for trimming. And I'm gonna do the same thing here, double-edged razor blade. And I'll start belly first, just like before. See it's all flat belly. And then for this part, I'll stick it back in my vise. I've seen some guys that put a temp, like put a template on here. So they keep the pop, the face the exact same each time. I don't do that, but I just kind of put my finger against it here and I kind of look at it and decide how far I want to make the sides. This time it's only going to be kind of a rough trim. So I'm going to trim back along that side and kind of flip it over. I'll do the same thing along this side. And I'm just kind of, like you said, I'm just kind of giving a rough trim. And you're preserving your collar there the same way as you did on the diver, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm stopping short, leaving some collar on there. 
And now I'll do the top. And you're gonna leave, really leave it a little larger than you'd want your fly to actually be. I'll show you why here in a second. That's just kind of a rough trim so far. And I'll, I'll trim it down a little when I get a little more when I give it its final trim. Um, next thing I'm going to do is I got a little, a little square of this is this is a square of paper that came off of a out of a package of eyes that your eyes come on, and you can use butcher paper. Anything works, but uh, I'm going to poke a little hole in it here. About like that, you see I got a little hole there. And always make sure you put the slick side down because if you put the other side down, it doesn't come off very easy. I, I actually just did that a couple of days ago. I put one the wrong side down. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I'm gonna take my liquid fusion again. I'm running out of here. And I'm gonna, I'm just about out of here. I got a couple more bottles, should be here any day. You know, give it a pretty generous coating of that on the face there. Now I'll take that little square and I will push it through, push the eye of the hook through that hole. Next thing, now this is just a, this is just a square of plastic I from a hook box or something I found. I don't even remember what, but. It's just a thin piece of hard plastic. And same thing, I've got, a, you can't really see it. It's got a bunch of stuff in it, but I've got a little hole I made in it. And I'm gonna do the same thing as I did with that paper. I'm gonna hook the hook eye through that hole. And usually I'll use a toothpick or something, but I don't have any toothpicks. So I got a bodkin here. And I'm just gonna slide that through the hook eye there. And what that will do is hold that plastic in place. And I will let that dry for uh, a couple, couple three hours and I'll, I'll probably be ready to work with it again so anyway I'll let's set that aside that's going to dry and I planned ahead so I have one here that I'd already done the same thing with so this is one that I've done earlier that's already dried I'll pop my plastic off there and my paper see it peels off really easy if you put the slick side down and you can see that gives your popper that nice flat profile there now see it's kind of it's got some rough edges. This one's trimmed pretty good, but I'll tr I'll trim it down a little more, and I'll do like I did with the collar on my diver. I will use my curved scissors and just kind of do an outline of how you know the shape I want my popper to be. We can't quite see what you're doing, so when you get a sec, would love to show you here. Yep, see you can see how I did the outline there of the face there. Okay, and I'll flatten that out on the bottom a little bit here couple yeah, see that there so you're almost creating a template with the yeah face. i just kind of take my round scissors and just make it the shape and size i want it to be and now i'll take my razor blade again and i'll just trim the excess here following that line i made with my scissors giving your Try to give it just a little, a little bit of a taper from front to back. Try not to cut yourself. Done good. I didn't cut myself on video yet, so. Now I'm nervous now that you've said it. Yeah. <laughs> so you got you always always got the super glue handy. One time I was one time I was tying the fly fishing show and I cut myself pretty good. And I went, I told the guys, I said, I gotta go there. I gotta run here just for a second. I went to the bathroom and come back out and it started bleeding. And well, the one guy walks and he goes, Oh, just use some of that super glue. He goes, I'm a surgeon. We use that stuff in the ER all the time, he says. So <laughs> I glued it up and so. <laughs> 
probably best not to run a, a carcinogen report on that. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. I'm sure the hospitals charge you a lot more, but <laughs> oh, I can, do, I can guarantee it. So anyway, so there, now you're all ready for your weed guard and everything. It's all. That's awesome. All then you use the good. same process for your weed guards same, and your mics same on process. this. Yep. And then, and I'll, I'll probably do a, I'll do a, maybe a little bit more of a light coating on the, on the face sometimes, but, uh, and of course, you know, coat the eyes and the belly, just like before you did up like you did with the diver. That's so. awesome. Well, we'll go ahead and try to, you know, in the interest of time, uh, we'll try to get a, a couple pictures of these after the fact from you and we'll, we'll oh, kind sure. of do yeah. a, a final picture at the end. Yep. But uh, Derek, thank you very much. Uh, I think this is thank a you. really great introduction to anyone who's had any interest in doing deer hair, whether that's divers or poppers or whatever else you want to do. Uh, if well, you have any questions, say that again. Oh, I said, this will work for everything. So, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, thank you again, Derek. And uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions for Derek, you know, feel free to forward those on our way. We'll make sure they get to him and, and we'll go ahead and do some follow-ups with some answers. So uh, yeah, can't thank you enough for being here. Uh, everyone who's been with our Time with the Pros series so far, uh, thank you for being part of it. Thanks for having me.